Uh, lots on the agenda. I want to run through sort of um, how we have tonight organized and what we hope to accomplish. Um, uh, we will spend a little, just a short few minutes for catching everybody up to um, how we got here today, go over uh, the master planning process. Sorry, I'm getting used to not having bifocals, so I need them to see your faces, but I don't need them to see this, so we're just going to apologize for that. Uh, we'll catching everybody up, talking a little bit about the master planning process, where we are in that, the physical building assessments that we've already done, looking at enrollment trends briefly. Uh, then we'll spend a majority of our, our evening tonight hearing about the results of the educational facility evaluation, which is the second half that the architects can, um, conducted. And most importantly, we'll be hearing from our experts. We have a panel of teachers and students who are going to be here tonight to talk about how their experience compares to what does the research say about best facilities, what's their experience in our current facilities. So, uh, then we'll end with a gallery walk where you'll get a chance to dig into the data for each building a little more deeply and get a chance to talk to the principal from those buildings if you have specific questions. So we have a lot of different kinds of things planned tonight uh, to give you um, uh, several different ways for you to interact with the information from master planning. So why now? Why are we talking about facilities now? Um, for several reasons. One, we have very clear expectations from our Board of Education about achievement and expectations for what our kids can and should be able to achieve um, post high school and for our community. Um, we have um, a community and students who are demanding more and different and better. Uh, so it is, uh, it's our responsibility to, to look at that and help deliver that for our students and for our teachers. We have a situation where our current facility doesn't, um, doesn't hold fit the space for all of the students that we have, and that also keeps us from expanding programming. So we have a situation where we may want to, or the kids may want different programs, or kids may want to be involved in different programs, and we simply don't have the space to expand to add those. So there's several uh, very practical reasons why we need to be talking and looking at facilities right now. So this all started sort of back in 2015, um, a group of parents and community members around athletics and around our fine arts really challenged us to start looking at how could we be improving those areas, which caused us to um, take a bigger, larger look at our whole facilities plan as a whole rather than looking at the pieces. So this idea of destination Loveland was born. And the idea of how does Loveland become this destination district? How can we be more for our community and for our students? And that group of community members, some of you in here were served in Destination Loveland, um, really looked at what does the research say about what kids <coughs> should be able to do and, and experience while they're in school? What, what are other uh, great facilities? What do they look like? We went on site visits. We read research. We talked about different ideas and spent um, about a year and a half really exploring that. We had a transition in leadership um, and got new people on boarded with those ideas and then continued to spend this year researching. Um, our expert teachers um, have gone on some site visits with us this year. We've been talking with students, so getting smarter about what we could be doing so that we can lead us into this master planning process. So we come to 2018 and over and over and over, what I hear when I have community opportunities to be with you and your community members is, get on with it, get on with it, get on with it. We're talking about it, let's do something. And so that's why we're here in the master planning process where we are, because we're, we're getting ready to do something. So uh, as a quick reminder, uh, we are, we are committed to input and all ideas for our master planning process. This is not one of those situations where we already know what we're going to do and we're just bringing you along for the ride and we already have the end game plan. Um, we really don't. We have some ideas, we have some limitations, some things that we know can and can't work just out of reality, but we are very open to what could work and great ideas. So there are no preconceived notions about how this is going to end when we make our presentation to the board in May. The other reality is, is there's no zero cost option. We are looking at our facilities and changes are going to have to be made. At the end of this, we cannot come up with a plan that says, oh, it's fine the way it is. There are things that must be addressed. So at the end,
end of this, there is no zero cost option and no option to not do anything. So those are two, those are two truths as we enter into tonight. Um, master planning um, is a process. We contracted with um, uh, Immersion Design, which we have Brett and Christy are here from Immersion Design. They conducted the master planning um, facilities assessment. They help us with the master planning process. Um, that looks like um, how, helping all of us talk about how do we improve our physical space, the physical assessment, while also advancing what our kids need and deserve while still remaining phys uh, fiscally responsible. So how do we balance all three of those things? Like, every, like having everything that our kids want and deserve costs money. So how do we do something that our community will support that's fiscally responsible, yet still can further the dreams and what our kids deserve and what we want for them while maintaining a physical safe building around them? So that's, that is the whole crux of master planning and what the work that we're doing. So the timeline that we're on, we're at the second tiger up there. So the first tiger was when we got together, and I was just gonna look up this date before I sit up here and I forget. September, September something, September. We um, had the physical assessment, and that's where we heard about the boilers, the roofs, the tile, the physical, the, the actual building. Then we uh, continue to learn, continue to do site visits, and continue to talk with students. And now we're at that second tiger, and we're hearing about the educational facilities. So this is how do kids learn in these buildings. We know the quality of the roof, we know the quality of the floor. Tonight is about how can kids and teachers learn and teach and grow in our facilities. That's what tonight's about. The third tiger is January 23rd. And that's where we'll hear the community the first set of possible master plan options. Configurations of buildings, what buildings might be new, what might buildings might be rehab. Uh, that's where we'll hear those first ideas. And then we'll travel across through the map, through the next, which says option development there. We'll have some focus groups, use this data to pick priorities, and then we'll present to the Board of Education at the May board meeting, that last Tiger out there, a master plan that we've all had input into. So that's the timeline that we're on, and we're at Tiger Head number two tonight. So quick reminder of the physical building assessments. Um, on the next slide, you'll see um, that there's a, that's a picture of all the presidents, and that's when each building was built. So you can get some sort of idea of how old each building is. A more detailed individual building assessment appears on the board. So as a reminder of that physical assessment data, there's a summary of that on the board, and that's online, um, the whole presentation that we provided in September. Um, then we're also considering our enrollment projections. So that's something that we work on constantly. We um, have hired some experts. We look at our own trends. Um, that graph is Sort of a basic graph to show you the bottom part would be a conservative growth of if things went along as you know as planned and that's likely what would happen if they followed a trend that high the high bar there is what could happen if every piece of available property in the Loveland City Schools sold and they built places for children to live and go to school in. So we have to guess sort of in between what that looks like to make sure that we, when we do make a facilities plan that we're ready for growth as it's happening in our community. So that's also a piece of what we talk about before the, that master plan is delivered. So that's all the work we've been doing up until today to get us to tonight. So, I, mean, I get to go to school every day. I get to see how kids change, I get to see how teachers change, I get to see how things evolve. Many of you in the room experienced school the first time when you went through, and that's, that's how you think about school. And you're experiencing it maybe through your kid children and seeing how things are different. But you know, you know school how you know school. When we think about master planning, buildings, you build buildings to last for 50 years. It asks us to look into the future. We don't have a crystal ball, um, but we did find um, a, an interesting video that looks 
looks at what life might be like in the year 2028, which is 50 years. That's the end of our master plan. So, what? Part of your plan. Sorry, my math skills are not high. <laughs> 10 years from now, 50 years from now. That was when I graduated from high school. Um, remember the bifocal thing? Um, 28 years. To look into the future. But we do. That aside, it does cause us to look into the future even beyond that. When we're thinking about a facility, you have to think about something that will support us for the next 50 years. We don't know what that's going to look like. But we do know that building the same thing we have now with prettier windows isn't what's going to do what our children need and what our teachers need to deliver education. So we're gonna take just a few minutes and ask you to suspend what you remember about school and think about what life could be like in the next 10 years. Look at this uh, brief three minute video um, just so we have uh, an opportunity to change the way we think for just a minute. So I'm gonna turn it over to the video and step off to the side. So while we transition to bring our experts up on stage, turn and talk to your neighbor about that video for a second. How are we preparing, how are we preparing our students as a community, as a school, for such a life? Uh, depression, obesity, concerns, uh, global economy, languages being spoken, technology, needed, overtaking the world, all of those things. Turn and talk to your neighbor for a few minutes while we transition.
here at the board office who do the work with our principals and our kids. We have David Knapp, he's our Director of Technology and Innovation. We have Andrea Connors, she's our Director of Teaching and Learning. Eric Duell is our Director of Student Services. Uh, Suzanne Quigley is our Communications Officer. Uh, Kevin Hawley is our Treasurer. We have board member Ned Fortune is here. Am I missing any other board members? Did not see sneak in? Um, Cece Collins is um, on our uh, Building Tiger Nation Steering Committee. I saw Katrina Kirby, she's also on our steering committee. Uh, Julie Dunn's my assistant, and she makes all those things happen. So I have this great team of people here. We have uh, Christy uh, from Immersion, she's our architect, and where's Brett? Brett also from Immersion. So we have all this team that has to do all this work to make sure that we're meeting our deadlines and, and making these so that we can make this happen. Um, so um, it's, we are very excited to turn this over to our building principals and our panel of experts. And uh, I can't wait to hear what we'll learn tonight. So you're on. Okay, um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. That's okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about our educational facility evaluations um, that we did of your building. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to the folks that you really want to hear from, who I want to hear from as well, which are the students and the teachers. Um, but to talk a little bit about the educational facility evaluations, a team of us went into your building. Um, and as opposed to the physical building assessments, where all we looked at was literally the fact that it was a building. It really didn't matter that it was a school building when we did our physical building assessments. It mattered that it was a building and how were the building systems operating. The educational facility evaluation looks at the building and says, how do you function as a school? So when we do that, we look at six different categories. And within each of those categories, we had 106 different attributes that we as a team gave a score to, um, and then we totaled those scores up, and those kind of gave us an ability to be able to rank the building in terms of educational facility evaluation. So the six categories that we evaluated were the school site, structural and mechanical, plant maintainability, school building safety and security, educational adequacy, and environment for education. So yes, a large chunk of what we looked at in your building did specifically have to do with how do your classrooms support your teacher's ability to deliver curriculum. There were a lot of other things that we looked at as well, including things like school site. As a school, how does your site function well to allow your parents to drop off children in a safe manner? How do your high school students park and get into the building? Good also fall into the educational um, um, evaluation that we did. Next. So when we looked at all of your buildings and started to score them, um, we came up with some results. This is a district-wide summary page, okay? So it aver it's averaging all of the buildings, and we know four of your buildings are dated over 50 years, two of your buildings are newer, so we're averaging them all together and when you start to look at the breakdown of the six different categories, you can kind of see off to the right how, how they started to land. Um, and of those categories, three of them were what we would consider borderline. So borderline says, you know what, you're doing okay, but there's room for improvement. Um, three of those were unsatisfactory, and that would tell us, you know what, we really need to hone in on, on those different categories and see, for, see what we can do to improve them. Next. So then we start to take a look at a breakdown of your six different schools themselves. So this is a slide um, where we added some color to help quickly pick out the areas of greatest need. So again, we're looking at the six different categories and running across the top, you can see the early childhood, the primary school, the elementary school, the intermediate school, the middle school, and the high school. And if it is a one or is in red, that meant it scored pretty low in that particular category, so that would equate to being poor. All the way up to five, which you can only, you see one square in this matrix where we did see a five, and that means it's an excellent condition. You know what, we really don't need to spend a lot of time worrying about this. 
What this chart allows us to do is it allows us to quickly see the schools of greatest need. When we start to lay out master plan options, this will help us prioritize which buildings need the most help first. So we start to look for the reds and the oranges um, to try and steer us in the direction that we need, that we have the greatest need. And you can see that your older buildings, the early childhood, the primary, the elementary, that's where most of your reds and oranges, your ones and twos, are appearing in this assessment. But we also have some twos, some oranges that are in the middle school, high school. So that tells us there probably are some things that we need to address relatively soon in those buildings <laughs> as well. Okay. When we look at the educational evaluation assessment and married that up with a survey that we sent to all the staff asking about their buildings and all the conversations that we had with the kids in the different schools, we started to be able to pull out themes and needs that resonated across all of the buildings. So what this wheel is representing is five big need areas that we pulled out as major items across the board that we saw or that we heard from your staff. These aren't the only ones, but they are some of the main ones that we wanted to spend some time tonight digging down a little bit and talking to. So those five areas are adequate academic square footage, building and site navigation, potential for expansion, health and wellness, and inspirational and relevant. And we're going to take each of those five and drill down. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to talk about what does that even mean. I'm going to talk about what questions do these categories answer. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what research says and what the data is that's out there. And then the best part for each of these is we are going to understand what our tigers themselves said. So what did our students say? And when we are going to hand it over with each of these categories to our panelists up here for them to tell you their thoughts on them. So we'll start with the first need, adequate academic square footage. So what exactly does that mean? When I use the term academic square footage, I am talking about literally the teaching spaces in your building, the square footage dedicated to teaching our kids. So I am not talking about the gym. I am not talking about the administration offices. I'm not talking about the core or the bathroom. This is about classroom square footage. What does it answer, this topic? These are the questions we're trying to answer. Are our learning spaces large enough? Are they large enough for the class sizes that we have? Are they large enough to support the different learning modalities that our teachers would like to teach in? Are they large enough for our future enrollment projections? Do we have enough space to accommodate our desired program offering? We know that there are some programs out there that our kids would like to see potentially in their buildings, but we don't have the space available to be able to add those. And last, do we have varied space? We want to see more than just the same exact 700 or 800 square foot classroom marching down your hallways. Do we have varied spaces in your buildings to support small group, large group, individual needs? So what does the research say? Um, a lot of times when we are looking at research, especially when it comes to square footage, um, we look at what the state standard is. And when I say, say state standard, I'm talking about the um, Ohio, the OFCC, the Ohio Facilities Instruction Commission. When you are a school district that partners with them, they have a state standard that you have to follow. So it's kind of a good baseline for us to look at. I normally look at state standard, quite frankly, as a minimum. I always like to be more than what the bare minimum that the state says. Uh, but it does give us a good benchmark. So. When we're talking about academic square footage, the state standard 
for a 25 student classroom is 900 square feet. If you look, for example, at our elementary school, the average classroom size is 770 square feet. The state standard classroom for a kindergarten classroom is 1,200 square feet, where at LECC, 72% of the classrooms average less than 800. So if you were to talk to a kindergarten teacher, they would probably tell you that it's really hard to get all of the kindergarten centers laid out in their classrooms and the kids enough room to be able to explore all of the different centers. <coughs> the state required minimum square feet per student for academic square footage is 82 square feet a student for a 1,500 student high school. So that's somewhat comparable to our high school. Um, our high school currently has 64 square feet a student. So what that's telling us is that we are short overall on academic square footage in the high school. If the state were to look at your current high school and look at the total academic square footage in it, they would suggest an enrollment of 1,200 in that building. And we have to think that our projected enrollment 10 years out, when we look at our projections, we could have up to 1,800 students in that high school. So we need to start strategizing on ways to be able to receive that increase in enrollment growth. So as Christy talks about our data and really looks at the numbers in regards to our, our classroom square footage, we wanted to make sure to really open up the conversation and, and really paint the picture about what our Tigers had to say about all of these topics. Uh, through, the, through the month of October, um, I was lucky enough to work along with our administrative team to go out into all of our buildings and to spend really the, largely the part of that month uh, speaking with our students, speaking with our community, and speaking with teachers about all of these things. And um, what you're gonna see here tonight is we're gonna summarize some of those conversations that we've had, but then you're also gonna hear from teachers and students themselves. So over the course of the month, we got a chance to speak to over 700 students across grades one through 12 in Loveland. We also met with all of our building leadership teams and spoke to all of our teachers in that regard around these same topics. And lastly, I see lots of familiar faces in the audience uh, who came to our Portrait of a Tiger community sessions where we talked around much of the same topics. All of these conversations were collected and documented through use of a Mentimeter, which is really where we're pulling all of this data from. So when we think about our adequate academic square footage, our students, our Tigers, really support what the data says. Um, when talking to our students, our students largely indicated that if they could change things about their school, if they could design their own school, they would make things much more bigger and much more open. You know, when it comes down to it, our students, um, we, we hear them talk a lot about comfort in our classrooms. Why can't our, our schools be more comfortable? We need more room, we need more elbow room. We need space for personal work, for collaboration work. And ultimately, we just don't have room for that. We heard our students talk about that. We see a quote from a middle school student that said, if I could design my own school, I would make it bigger. I would make it so that we could have more lighting instead of just plain lighting. I would also like more windows as well. I think we should have bigger hallways so people can have more room. That's straight out of the mouth of one of our middle school students. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Fancher to talk about the same topic at LPS. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Mr. Fancher, I'm the principal at LPS for first and second grades. And honestly, as you see the pictures here, um, LPS, these are just examples of a lack of adequate space. This is especially true at LPS for small group instruction, as well as for large group instructional areas where we might foster um, educational exploration. The um, areas that you see here are our staff, really the district staff understands one principle, and that's early intervention trumps long-term. And so this, these pictures here are really of our small group intervention spaces that we currently use. And our staff has really spent years looking for nooks and crannies, trying to search and find areas that we can use for specialized instruction to occur. And what we end up going to LPS is we settle for what we have, and not ideally for what we, what we want for our students. Good evening, I'm Jen Porn, principal at LES. Um, as Christy mentioned a few slides ago, the state standard for average square footage for an elementary classroom would be about 900 square feet for a 25 um, student roster. 
At LES, we are at about 770 square feet, and our typical class size is about 28. Um, so we get asked questions a lot about our class size, but in order to make our class sizes down to about 24, we need to add two teachers at each grade level, which would add four rooms, which I don't have. So there's just not space in our room to add those four, or in our building to add those four rooms to get that class size down to 24. Um, the other picture you see there is just a narrow stairwell. That's um, a lunch and recess transition time. We don't have those open spaces or different barren spaces to use. As Mr. Fancher said, we've used every nook and cranny that we have available. I'm Peggy Johnson, the principal at the high school. When we talk about academic square footage at the high school, really we have three major issues. One, we don't have enough classrooms at all. Even adding additional classrooms just a couple of years ago was space then we had to take away from our media center. So the classes are awesome, but the media center is now overcrowded because of the use it gets every minute of every day, which is a good thing. We need additional classrooms and we don't have them, so we have five teachers that travel the building on carts. And if you've ever seen our hallways, a teacher trying to move a cart of materials through out the building to get to her next class, excuse me, his or her next class, it's difficult. It's difficult for the students to navigate as well. Uh, the hallways are crowded. They're carrying large backpacks, uh, projects, etc. Science labs. Um, we we want to add courses that require additional square footage for the kind of work that the students want to engage in. Uh, robotics, Project Lead the Way, those are additions. They've already outgrown their space in the matter of three years. So these are the students in robotics or Project Lead the Way. A lot of our science labs and classes are carrying around things with them and moving them from place to place in order to gain or find some space that they can work. Um, same happens in fine arts. We have our strings orchestra teacher teaching, sharing a room with our German teacher. They love it, not the best ideal situation. <laughs> Thank you. All right, panel, you're up. So the way that we're going to do this is we, we've arranged this so that we're going to, after each of our areas of need, we're gonna turn it over to students and teachers. Um, and we're gonna focus first question on students and the second one is gonna be geared towards teachers. So Pam, what we're going to ask is, just because you've got your name package, but unless you've got really good eyesight, you probably can't make that out. If you could just state your name and students, your grade, teachers, what building you're at um, before each uh, answer that you give us. So first question for the students. What are some examples of classroom or school spaces that you wish were bigger? And how does this impact your learning? OK, so I'm Drew. I am grade seven. Uh, a place that I wish was bigger would probably be the parking space out front because whenever I, whenever I get picked up or dropped off after school, uh, it's a little chaotic, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word. Uh, it's crowded, jam-packed, so there's a lot of people getting picked up. I'm Allie Bash, I'm in grade 11, and I would like for our science rooms, or when I was in chemistry last year, um, when you're doing labs, it's very packed, and students are back there working with chemicals that can be, like, can hurt students, and people are tripping over backpacks that are in between desks, and I don't think there's enough room for work to be done in lab areas. Colin Hatchbeth, and I'm in uh, grade 11. And I think our English rooms and our foreign language rooms should be bigger because those are kind of like two main classes where a lot of collaboration happens. <coughs> and um, our AP US history rooms have flexible furniture, which, make, which makes it really easy to collaborate with others. So I think the jam-packed kind of like feeling kind of disrupts the collaboration when you have to like scoot your desk all the way over to the other side of the room, or you can just with the furniture in the English room, you can just roll over to your friend and collaborate really easily. That kind of like simulates a everyday workforce environment. Well, hi, I'm Anna Coletto, I'm a sophomore. Um, from a fine arts perspective, 
there's a lot of issues with lack of space, um, especially in the fine arts fine arts section of the high school behind the cafeteria. Uh, students in both band and show choir, when there's two classes going on at the same time, have to put all of our backpacks on the hallway in the hallway because there's just no room for them in the classroom. And um, we have to push them up against the wall so if there is a fire drill or a weather emergency, we can get out. And um, especially in the auditorium, we have a similar problem. There is no storage space for anything. It gets shoved into areas that could be used for learning rather than um, you know, putting set pieces or costumes back there. And um, it's just something that would really help students in aspects of um, extracurricular. Hi, I'm Jacob Eldridge in 10th grade, and uh, while I'm not personally in the robotics programs, I have a lot of friends who are, and I know that the rooms are bad because they constantly complain. The rooms are just way too small for what they are doing requires. They, like, whenever they're deciding to work on the robot, they have to go out into the hallway because the room is filled with their computers and their desks. And so what they do is they keep the robot in one corner of the room, and when they're working on it, they move out the hallway, because that's where they can get enough room. And I think that's something that really needs to be improved, considering how excellent the robotics program is. Um, I'm Paxton, grade five, and a lot of math classrooms are just classrooms in general when you're working on big projects. Projects that need a lot of room, sometimes there's not enough room on the desks, so you have to work on the floor, but there's not much room on the floor either, so your projects are constantly getting stepped on and ripped by people walking by. So I think that sort of needs to be changed. <laughs> Sherman, I teach science at the high school. Um, so speaking to my classroom, um, at any given point, I have about 24 labs going on at the same time. When we change to the next schedule, I'll have 40. Um, that's in groups. And I have lab tables that don't move. They're as old as my classroom. And so my kids are doing labs and doing individualized work and doing partner work and doing everything in this really small space. And I have very little physical space for my material, so we get incredibly creative. But um, we make do, but I'm lacking in tremendous amounts of space. Hi, I'm Cindy Rack, third grade teacher, and I teach in the building that had FDR over it. <laughs> so when I think about this, I think truly of a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. Because our building was originally designed for high school kids. And we have made do, we, we do the best we can, but what happens when you talk about kindergarten meeting space, it just trickles right up into elementary as well. They don't matriculate all of a sudden down third grade to where they can just sit at a desk and they, they can be happy all day at a desk and don't need anything else. What starts out as centers in kindergarten then moves to different various options and modalities for learning that you need to supply in your elementary classroom. So you need a space for a project, you need a space for individual work, you need a space for small group work because all of these are the needs of your kids. And in a room that's already small and you have 25, 26, 27, 28 kids, that's, a, that's my biggest single challenge I think every year is how am I going to make my space work? Truly, we are squished. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brooke Hobson. I teach at LPS, second grade, and really can echo exactly what this teacher just said. Um, I have 27 adorable little second graders who are just on top of each other. Um, we try, you know, we make our rooms as really as cute as we can, and we make them really functional, but we have them all day. We have these same little 27 people all day long. And um, we have to teach them math and you know ELA, and we have to do a science class that we love to do. And we're just we're switching the room over for different purposes all day, and we do it you know happily um, because we know that's what they need. 
but they, the rooms were really designed for schooling a long time ago, um, and they're kind of designed for kids to sit in rows, kind of facing a board, you know, like we all went to school, and that's just not how they learn anymore. So our spaces are really not functional for, you know, STEM lessons and a variety of other um, types of collaboration. Um, my other thing is speaking for, you know, we have great classrooms, like we have our classrooms, but I'm thinking about the teachers who have um, the closets that have to go in the closet to teach their students. Um, again, they decorate them, they make them great and functional and do what you can, because that's what we do, we have one. But um, they have rooms with no windows and they have rooms with just a kidney-shaped desk and that's the only thing they can really fit with, you know, seven children. So um, those are the, the teachers I think about too, aside from us. Um, those buildings, they're just, they're designed for schooling from a long time ago, so. Thank you all. Yep. Awesome. Chris, come back here. Okay, the next need um, that really rose to um, the top uh, was all about navigation, um, both building navigation and site navigation. And when we talk about building navigation, we're really talking about our hallways in our building. How our kids get from point A to point B within our building. Um, and when we talk about site navigation, we're talking about literally how you navigate your site. So we're talking about traffic, we're talking about parent drop-off, how students park and come in, how parents, staff, and community interact with your site, and then enter your building. So what questions does it answer? One, does our site accommodate our needs? Does it accommodate our student drop-off and out front um, at pickup and dismissal? Um, are our hallways easy to navigate and efficient? Um, are they welcoming for the kids as they are transitioning from one class to another? Or are they intimidating? Um, we have hallways in some schools that are very, very long, um, and you can't even see to the end of them. So we need to think about how that feels for a little six-year-old trying to travel from point A to point B. Are the adjacencies of our learning spaces appropriate for their given use? Are our specials that our kids going to in a centralized location, or do they have to travel way far away to get to an art class just to try and then make it all the way back to another core class? Are our loud spaces next to other spaces that can accommodate that noise? Or are they adjacent a space where we have someone that's trying to teach um, a more thought-provoking lesson that where they need some quiet? Um, and then just in general, how are our spaces secured around the building? Okay. So what does the research say? So if we go back to the state standard that I was talking about before, the state talks about dedicating about 20% to circulation. Um, and, and that they also have regulations for corridor width themselves. Um, when we look at, for example, the elementary and the primary school, our corridors take up 25%. Uh, but they don't take up to 25% because they're nice and gracious in width. They take up 25% because the building's been added on to so many times, and as you add addition after addition, you tend to end up with very long, um, narrow corridors. So even with all of that excess corridor square footage that that building has, the quickest way for our kids to visit the cafeteria right now is to actually go outside. Um, because of the circuitous route that you have to take to get from one end of the building over to the cafeteria. Over 50% of school bullying happens in our corridors. This is one of the main reasons why we like to focus on what that circulation space looks like. We like to look at the width to make sure it's giving our kids enough room to be able to pass each other without bumping into each other. We also want to make sure that we have good sight lines and transparency into our corridors so that we can always have an eye on what's going on around us and we can start to curb some of that um, bullying that might happen. So if we look at the high school, the high school corridor width, a typical corridor in the high school, is eight to eight and a half feet. The state standard would suggest 12 feet. 
So you know you're kind of setting yourself up when you talk about kids having to bend over and get in the locker and pass by two ways with backpacks, you are starting to introduce some of that um, compression in the corridors. So in speaking with our students, I, I think, you know, speaking on behalf of, of our group who spoke to kiddos, I think we were surprised the number of times that we heard you all talking about hallways and what, um, what an issue that is. If you've ever been to high school or middle school during a class change, you know just how crowded things can get. Um, and ultimately, our, our students are challenged by that. They um, are challenged to get to class on time, to have elbow room with their locker when they're not bumping into their neighbor. Um, so we heard a lot of those stories from our students. Um, as one high school student said, uh, if I could design my own school, I would make the size of the school bigger because the hallways in most classes are full and filled with people. I would like hallways with enough room for the students to not get backed up due to congestion of people. We heard a lot of uh, the term traffic jams coming up in regards to this. Uh, another high school student said, I would like to change our parking situation. It needs to be bigger and have more spaces and better lighting. It's dangerous when you try to park and get into the building. So we, we heard these come up with talking about adequate square footage, and we're also hearing these concerns with parking and entryways, along with our building and site navigation as well. Okay. So honestly, as you've heard others on the panel say, um, Rob, yes, in regards to navigation, we make do. Um, our day, congestion is a constant variable throughout the day for staff and for students. Um, you can see from the parent drop off and pick up, to the transitions within the building. We have resource rooms that are not in close proximity to the classrooms they serve. So in order for students to get to the resources and services that they need, they have to travel long hallways and spend time waiting for congestion to clear to transition to the places they need to be. And that actually is compounded by the first thing I talked about, and that's the lack of small group instructional space. So we end up, as you see in this one picture, we have lovely workstations out in the hallway that turn a hallway that has eight feet of space into really a hallway that is actually six feet wide to navigate. So it even makes it more of a challenge for our staff and students. So at LES, <coughs> Christy mentioned earlier about our kids going outside for lunch, their pictures over there. And it's kind of because LES has a Dr. Seuss footprint as the blueprint. Um, all roads lead to nowhere, so that's our quickest route. Also, our students walk outside to go to our music class because our music space inside was just not sufficient, so our music is in a portable outside. Um, so I think about site navigation inside, but I think even equally as challenging, if not more so, is the site navigation outside of our building. So if you've ever had the pleasure of coming to LES at pick up, drop off, just have lunch, to drop something off, to come to a special event, there's no parking, we know that. <laughs> And um, I think it impacts our community at large in the morning because we often back up traffic. People are nodding their heads, yes. We back up traffic on Melbourne Madeira. We, Kevin and I have had to work with our local law enforcement people about that sometimes, and we try to come up with better ideas. But so that site navigation impacts us every day, both inside and out. Good evening, I'm Chuck Ogden, I'm the middle school principal. Um, before I talk about my hallways, I know a couple tigers came in the back. We just did a clean sweep of Walnut Hills, ECC rival. When I left, it was two to eight bottoms, and they pulled it out, so good job, I love that. Um, but focusing on my hallways, this picture to the left, very tight, we had 783 students. In fact, we had to stagger our dismissal in the afternoon so that we don't have 783 bodies try to shove themselves through the halls. You notice that we have lockers on top of each other. If you've had a son or daughter go through the middle school, it's a man right, I need a top locker, I need a top locker. Nobody wants a bottom locker for obvious reasons. Um, we had issues, we, we had to fumigate some of the lockers today because there were, there were a couple roaches in there. Um, it is an ongoing issue, space, lockers that have been there since. Lyndon Johnson was the pres president, I did know that. Hi guys, I'm Garth Collier, the building principal uh, of the Intermediate Building, and I do not want to get the elbows and the punches for when it's my turn to talk about when, when we saw the colored sheet up here, most of those higher numbers were from the Intermediate Building because it's the newest building. 
Um, however, there are some building and site issue, issues, um, circulation issues that we have. So even though we have a wider hallways at the intermediate building, which is really nice to have, and our students are smaller than the middle school students, so that works out really well. Our issues come into play inside the building, and for those of you who have had kids come through the intermediate building, it's kind of like our setup where the clinic and where, where kids would get dropped off is really far away from where instruction happens. So that is one piece. Um, if we're gonna talk about you know, what are things that are some barriers and obstacles for us, that's one piece. Um, another piece, of course, is the pick up and drop off um, here at, the, at this whole site for middle school and intermediate. Um, just like down at LPS and LES, we have traffic issues, we have congestion out front. Um, and, you know, kids getting from their space here at the intermediate down to the circle desk area to be dismissed is quite a walk. And or if you were going to the clinic, if you're a fifth grade kid upstairs and you need to get to the clinic, um, it is quite the journey. However, you know, the rest of our, you know, kind of navigation issues that we have are really small compared to some of the other buildings. saw the student quotes already and actually heard from our students in terms of in the building navigation. But you may be thinking, well, why are those kids carrying those big backpacks around all day? Okay, good question, fair enough. The lockers are way too small for the equipment that they need to bring to school every day. Um, and if they're going from one class upstairs at the front of the building to the next class downstairs at the bottom corner of the building, they actually do not have time to unload and reload. So uh, it may say, like, well, don't have them carry all that stuff. In theory, great idea. In practice, it just doesn't work that way for them. Um, in terms of parking, anytime you have 400 teenagers driving somewhere, <laughs> safety would be a number one concern. Uh, yet I want to be honest, the students do a little bit better job than the parents at pickup time. And again, part of that is traffic flow, for sure. Trying to get in to get their student, their younger student maybe who needs to get to a job or to a doctor's appointment or to whatever. So we're always trying to negotiate, hey, if you hurry up and you can get in and out of your buy, you will actually have be able to do that in the time frame you're booking. Nothing's more frustrating than pulling up as a parent trying to get your kid to the doctor for a 2.30 appointment and you're going to go, oh my God, I'm not going to get it done. So um, we have actually taken over some of the civic parking, I think. Um, they've been very kind not to bug us about that. But again, um, we can't turn all of our green space into parking and navigation for drop, pick up and drop off. The goal would be to figure out a, a system on a mark, uh, to enlarge the property to make it safer for both students and the adults coming in to, to get their students. All right, panel. Thank you guys to talk about building and site navigation. Students, what difficulties in the hallways have you personally experienced going from class to class? My name is Hannah Polakowski. I'm in seventh grade. Um, usually in the mornings or in, in the afternoon going home, we always have trouble getting through the halls, getting to the doors we need to, getting to the classes because there's so many people congested or always trying to get to their lockers or trying to get through everybody trying to get to their lockers. So I think the hallways need to be like a little wider because otherwise everybody might get late to class or just don't have enough room to walk through. Hi, I'm Paxton Mers, grade five, and uh, a lot of the time when we're just going to lunch from outside, it, everyone in the hallways is pushing and shoving, trying to get in front because they know that since even the hall, like, I don't know if you consider over there a hallway, but um, <laughs> it's very crowded and everyone's trying to push their way to get into the front because if you're behind, you're not gonna have a lot of time to eat, especially if you're buying. So they, we, it's, it's very, I wouldn't say it's violent, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's a lot of pushing. <laughs>
lunchbox for your locker when everyone's locker is really close by because everyone's just packed and trying to get to one place. So I think being this big by the locker is more fun. I'm Evan Patterson in eighth grade, and something that personally affects me is the eighth grade hallways. They're really long, so when we let out of lunch, we have a few minutes to get to our next class. And when your locker's on the other opposite side of the school from your next class, it takes you a while to get there and you don't really have a lot of time, so you're trying to wait a few minutes. I'm Colin Moran, I'm a 10th grader. And one difficulty that I have uh, run into is joining my fourth block class. It was a uh, recently added classroom and uh, the hallway flow does not really like work because they are going across and we have to go in. So like, it's pretty difficult to get into the class. Um, in that same area, there's one uh, corner in the hallway that we talked about earlier this week that is a problem for everyone. There, um, there's one hallway going this way and then it turns, but in that corner there is a staircase and it al is also covered by lockers on both sides. So students trying to get upstairs are struggling. Students trying to get into classes are struggling. Students trying to get into their lockers are struggling. And it takes two to three minutes just to get through that one portion of the hallway, which takes up our five minute break to get to our next class. And it's just kind of a bit of a struggle for everybody. Um, my name is Megan Molly and I'm in 12th grade. Um, one of the biggest things for us is at uh, 225, when it's time to leave and everyone is rushing out of the school. Um, it takes me probably three or four minutes just to reach the doors of the building, just because the hallways are so congested. Everyone is on top of each other. We're all trying to go out the same doors. Um, and then you get out into the parking lot and the parking lot, the student parking lot is terrifying. Um, it's small and people are zooming in and out, um, and it's just not very practical for what we need um, in a high school. All right. Teachers, what are some ways that you have personally experienced or witnessed someone having difficulty getting in or out of your building during key times? Hi, I'm Kristen Rigby, and I teach in middle school. Um, and as Mr. Ogden and all the kids have talked about the hallways, um, from a teacher perspective, we're in the pods in our building, and the pods, it's pretty empty during class change, but the hallways are jam-packed. So for a safety and a monitoring perspective, it's hard for us to see the kids. Um, there's also some cubbies in the hallway where they can kind of hide or stand that we can't see them. So monitoring them during that time is hard. Hi, my name is Katie Burke, and I teach at the high school. And uh, my classroom overlooks the uh, parking lot, the student parking lot. So um, one thing that they can see is that about 1.55, about 30 minutes before the end of the day, parents start lining up along the way. And by the time the end of the day happens, the parents are lined up and around the corner and headed down Tiger Trail. So you know, you've got the parents in there, and then you've got, of course, the students trying to exit. It's probably, I mean, it probably takes 20 minutes to get, I imagine, for most people to get out of that parking lot area. You know, it's what happens when you have lots of, you know, student drivers. Um, and so that, that's a real, real problem, I think. Oh, our building also has a lot of problems with parking um, at LTS. Uh, we just have what you see there in the front, um, and it also, you know, during the peak times, we, we want parents to come into our building. Like, we are so customer service oriented at LTS, and um, they, you know, we have conferences, and pen night, and fine arts night, and all the parties. We want all those helpers, um, our parade days, and our days with us, and there is, there's not enough parking even for the staff, so then we have parents that are often late to all these events, um, pen night, especially when they're kind of new to the whole situation. They're often coming in embarrassed and they're late and, and you know, that, that stinks for parents. Um, we want, you know, it to be a good experience right out the gate, right? Um, and then also that that idea of like, we have parents and, and families that are out on Love on the Road just trying to get into the building and 
it, it gets a little crazy in the morning and um, and in the afternoon. Um, so the parking is, is a little crazy. And then it's, it's our, our hallways are really, really long. And a lot of times, especially like the first couple months of school, we'll find like third graders that have ended up down in, in our end of the hallway. <laughs> and they're so lost because where I teach is like the very end of LPS. So if they're down there, it's like, you know, they're super lost. Uh, so we have to like ready to fall back and it just happens, you know, they're little and we try to put the little stickers on the ground, the little arrows on the ceiling and stuff and make it great, but um, they just, they get lost, so. Thank you. Uh, and I've got to, I've got to compliment the, the panel of students because they are dead on this subject. From what they're talking about from outside the buildings to inside the buildings when they're talking about trying to change classrooms and students crisscrossing, some going this way, classes going this way. My classroom is right by that lovely little hallway you saw that leads to the cafeteria. So I see this every day. And all I can tell you is my third graders know what it is when I say traffic jam. And we're not out on the highway. We're standing at our door and we can't go anywhere. So, okay, time for mental math. You know, you just have to make it work. But it is every day what we deal with in our building. self-explanatory. What is the capability of our site <coughs> to add on to our buildings? So what is it answer? It answers the question, is our site large enough to accommodate our future? And we, when we look at, at your future, we need to take into account lots of things. Increasing enrollment is an obvious one. The additional courses we might want to teach if we want to change from half-day kindergarten to full-day kindergarten, at some point, do we need to expand our athletic complex and is there a need for a fine arts center? So these are just a few examples of some of the things that as we're evaluating the site capacity that we're thinking of. So again, what does research say? State suggested site size to accommodate a 500 student elementary school, so like LECC, is 15 acres, and LECC currently is 12 acres. So if you start to think about going to full day kindergarten, needing to double the number of kindergarten classrooms we have, we already are at a site size that is less than what the state would suggest for our current enrollment. Um, for a 1200 student elementary, so LES, LPS, the state would suggest 22 acres. Right now, they have 16 acres, so less. The problem is, is three and a half acres of that is our bus facility, which really means our school is only getting 12.6 acres. So it has about half the site that ideally we would like to see. That's why your parents are parking across the street at a parking lot that isn't ours. Um, For a 1,500 student, fifth through eighth school, so for this building, state would suggest 35 acres, and we are currently sitting on 24 acres at this site. So again, as we, and what drives that 35 acres for this site is because of the middle school component. If I was to just say an elementary of 1,500 students, it would not suggest 35 acres. But because there's a middle school sitting here, a middle school brings along with it added athletic, added athletic fields that a lot of times our elementaries don't. Um, and just some added building infrastructure that sometimes our elementaries don't. So that's what's making this site um, a bit of a struggle um, in terms of size. You know, in talking to our students, our students talk a lot about a need and a desire for more electives to match their interests and their, their potential careers. You know, when you think about our potential for expansion, you know, we offer some amazing courses and programs at Loveland. You know, from, from our biotech program to show choir to digital arts to, to AP electives options, we, we offer so much, but we really are at our critical mass when it comes to offering more of these electives that are tied to our academic pathways. Um, so I, as, we, as we hear from our students and our teachers tonight, I think we're going to hear both from that the potential for expansion for our buildings, but also in regards to our, our core programming. 
Jesse? Good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. My name is Jesse Coles. I am the principal of the Early Childhood Center. And as you can see up here, we have a music class happening in what also serves as our lunchroom and cafeteria. We have trailers set up for our art and music classes. And you mentioned, we, she mentioned full day kindergarten. We know research and data will tell us that is the route we want to go. Parent conversations we have had and parent feedback we have received tells us that's the route we want to go. Right now, we just do not have the classrooms to pull that off. We're looking at incorporating more STEAM and more maker space type lessons for our kiddos to help prepare them as they move up. And we just do not have the spaces right now to do those types of things the way we would like to. We have a couple of pictures up here. To the left is our auditorium, which is the original auditorium when this campus was built. You notice, even though it's a little dark, I can only get one class in there at a time. PTSA has been very generous this year. We have a number of motivational and educational speakers in. Well, we have to have two separate meetings. When we have class meetings, we have to have two separate meetings. We had two concerts at the beginning of this week, and if you've ever been in a concert in there, there are, there are things that kick on. So somebody will be playing a it's a ventilation unit from 1960-something, and, and we deal with it. And our music program is amazing, but it is something we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We look to the right, we have kids crouching, we have, have kids stuffed in, in corners, anywhere we can get them. Again, we're doing a great job with what we have, but it's not what it could be. Our music rooms, we have Mr. Er, Heening and, and Ms. Stag that are in music rooms that, again, when they're trying to compete and sound is blowing through the doors, that's a real struggle. We have dilapidated athletic facilities behind us, as Ms. Boron was talking about, what it is to be a middle school. This is where it starts as we pass the torch to Ms. Johnson in the high school. All right, panel. <coughs> Students, what additional courses or elective offerings would you like to have at school? Well, uh, for fifth and sixth grade, we don't really have elective, but that would be really cool to have for us to expand our learning so that when we get into older classes, we can be more prepared for them and like electives, more science electives. Um, like me personally, like beginner forensic science, but that might not be for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so like um, just more diverse science classes. Yeah. Um, my name is Drew Holman. I am in seventh grade. A uh, course that I think uh, probably seventh up should have would probably be business class. It helps you get to know what you could do in the future, uh, what people do for a job, which I think is really helpful to know at this age. It helps you get to know what you're going to do in the future, which is also really good. Um, one thing I think that um, struggle that students might struggle with in the high school if they want to like, get into music, for me it seems like it would be something very hard, because all the music classes are either our AP music theory class, or you have to audition to get into one of the three like types of classes. And I think that can just seem very daunting from an outside person, I don't know, because I've been in music since fifth grade, but if you're someone who hasn't, it seems like it would be very difficult to get into, and I think music is something that should be more accessible. I'm Colin Moran, I'm a 10th grader, and to also agree with like what Paxton said, I think that we need to uh, expand our science classes at the high school, because uh, I know that I want to go into more of a science-y kind of field, and I know lots of other of my friends that want to go into that kind of science field, so getting some of those classes could really help me be more prepared for my college education. Um, building off of electives, uh, we don't have a theater class at the high school. We have a speech and drama class, which is a language arts elective, but it is all the way at the bottom of the building, completely separate from the fine arts portion of the school, and just a regular theater class that works with the drama program is not currently because we just don't have the space for it right now. 
I think a career exploration course would be very cool for specifically sophomores because a lot of sophomores or high schoolers even don't know what they want to be, what they want to go into study, or they don't even know what careers are out there. And I think learning all these things would be really cool. I mean, you can at the end go and explore, I mean, shadow one of these career places and see then if you can focus junior year on these things and if you like it, then fall right into college. Um, building off of the business electives, I know that business is like the number one major that kids from Marvin High School go into after um, their education at the high school. And we always start on it, but we only have one teacher and that was added this year. And he teaches like two or three courses. And I think it would be cool to have more teachers so they could teach different aspects of the business fields since it's the um, leading major at level. All right, thank you. All right, teachers, what limitations do you think we face in regards to expansion of our offerings and programs at various grade levels? <coughs> Hi, I'm Becca Elger, and I'm a full-day kindergarten teacher at LECC. So I'm really going to talk about that full-day piece. Um, I am one of three full-day teachers, um, just digging deeper into what the, you've heard a little bit already. Um, I'm one of three. Um, there are five other sections, and they're all half-day, so that makes eight, eight total in our district, in case you didn't know. Um, but we really, really, really wanted to go to as many sections as we can of full-day. There's just immense benefits for our our youngest tigers to um, be a part of a full day program. Um, number one, the benefit of time. You're talking um, segments of time and you know you can ask any half day teacher um, that go from like 15 to 20 to 25 minutes to we're talking 40 to 60 minutes in content areas that need to be dug deeper into. Um, there's so much more in visualized education that happens um, in a full day setting, stronger, um, deeper teacher student relationships. Um, really knowing each of my students in my classroom um, is something that really comes about with having them for the whole day. Um, and that also goes to say with my parents as well, um, because instead of having two groups of say 24, I just have the one. Um, and I'd say the last piece that I really wanna mention is the teaching and learning piece. Um, and I did touch on that a little bit. There's so much more deeper inquiry and sharing opportunities that you have when you're in full day. Um, Hi, I'm Katie Rudisell. I teach at the middle school. I teach science. Um, and when I think of our limitations um, at the middle school, and I'm sure at other buildings, space, that's the number one limitation that I feel like not just science teachers have, all teachers have. Um, I look at just talking with my colleagues and wanting to do all these cross-curricular lessons um, and STEM challenges and problem-based learning. And we just don't have the space to not only house the materials, but house the students while they're working on these things. Um, and to really facilitate those kind of life skills, those um, critical thinking skills that would benefit all students, no matter what career they decide to go into.
for our kids. A 25% improvement in their test scores when they have the appropriate daylighting entering their classroom. Windows, that's a little bit different than daylighting. Windows offers our kids the ability to rest their eyes for a second, see something outside, and then kind of bring them back and refocus. 15 to 23% faster rate of improvement. And then with acoustics, one of the, one uh, data point that I find really interesting is that 25 to 30% is the average number of words that our kids don't hear properly when a teacher is delivering alignment. As adults, it is very easy for us to fill in the gaps of those missing words because we've had our lifetime to develop vocabulary and we know what someone meant to say. A little kindergartner has no idea what someone meant to say. That 25 to 30% loss for words is drastic for them because they don't know, oh, the teacher meant to say, put the word the in there, or but, or and, or whatever words that they're missing. There is evidence that modest changes in room temperature affects the ability for our kids to perform. So if they go from one class where they're super hot and they have to take off all their sweaters and they're sitting in, in a t-shirt to the next classroom that's super cold, that's affecting their body and their ability to stay focused. Children in classrooms with high outdoor air ventilation rates, so fresh air coming in, can have a great effect on their standardized test, on any test score. Okay, so what is our tiger saying? Overwhelmingly, um, when she mentioned daylight, that, that came out a lot. I wanted to point out in this particular slide that when I spent some time at the high school, one thing they often talked about were the plain colors and the fact that sometimes when they were in the building, they felt like they were in a prison. So I don't think they actually are in prison. I don't think that's what they meant. It's just the mood and the feel of the building. So when I dug a little bit deeper, that's typically what they were saying. When we look at the quote up here from one of our students, I would change the comfort in the classroom. I think having different lighting would be helpful because bad lighting really affects how we feel. Last one from our kids, okay. So when you talk about health and wellness, pull it up against an LES. Uh, being in an old building that you saw, like 57 Shiv, that's when um, LPS was built, 1957, and really it, it just invites concerns over temperature and wellness and air quality. But the two pictures I have up here for you guys to look at, it's really our HVAC systems that were retrofitted to the building. They make it extremely difficult control variances in temperature. We have rooms that are freezing. It takes me like 20 minutes sometimes at home to thaw out after a day like today. And then um, they can be noisy at times. Some of you have mentioned that already. And then um, really the, the picture to the left is we have restrooms and facilities that weren't built with accessibility in mind. So this restroom is actually one of our restrooms that we have that were, it was originally equipped with two toilets. And you see on the left there, the toilet was removed and the drain is plated over and the stuff is still sticking out of the wall, but that was done so that we have um, the ability for students with special needs to use this restroom. And this is also a shared restroom with the adults in the building, so just even having access to the restroom facilities and waiting your turn becomes an issue at LPS. So we have some pictures up here to the left is one of our science classrooms that's definitely been a, a, a theme here and I think of, there's nothing more valuable in a science class than to be able to maybe look at the environment outside. Um, absolutely no windows. Here to the right, this is in our seventh grade pod. That is actually in the hallway. Again, absolutely no windows. So when you're in seventh grade, you graduate to windows when you go to the eighth grade. Basically, I guess you have to earn your sunburn mask to, to put it bluntly. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, the student panel. So, what environmental factors inside your school keep you from performing your best? Um, hi, my name is Michaela, and something that keeps me from performing my best is in the history pod, there are no windows. So, some classes. 
just feel like it's like really scary. It kind of makes the past a little bit miserable. But now I'm just glad that this is gone. But <laughs> yeah. I'm Evan and I'm in eighth grade. And something that we could probably add to the school that is an environmental factor is air conditioning in the gym. Because Mr. Schmuel, our gym teacher, talks about it a lot. It gets really hot after like a long workout or a, a big game that we're playing. And it takes a long time to cool down. So the next class we go to, we're like always really hot. And the boys' bathroom right next to the gym kind of really don't want to go in there. Like it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like 85 degrees and it's really hot and yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that I think the high school needs is um, more windows in our classes. Because I know sometimes after I'm taking time to do my best on a problem or I'm writing a problem, uh, I like to look outside because it helps, like, it let, let, lets me stay more serene. And I know my math class, uh, usually when I'm done taking my tests, I look outside and Let's me stay a little more calm from getting that thought of me getting a bad grade. <laughs> Going back to like the heating and cooling stuff, um, my second class of the day is uh, in Spanish, and it's kind of like a tucked away classroom under the stairs, and it's right next to like a uh, heating system. And it's a super small classroom, and there's 35 of us in there, so that doesn't really help at all. And then right after that, I go to a um, English class, and it's freezing in there, so the change of temperature kind of like affects my learning. Um, I'm Megan. I'm a senior, and um, uh, kind of what to go off what Colin said, uh, the temperature differences between the classrooms, um, it's um, they're so. They fluctuate so much. In one of my classrooms, the AP Environmental Science, um, we came into the classroom one day and the ceiling tile was laying on one of our desks. The ceiling was dripping and the ceiling collapsed um, right onto one of the desks. Uh, we could have been in there, it could have been um, a bad result. Luckily, no one was hurt or anything. So we adjusted, but um, in in that classroom, we have to become very creative because of the small space along with the lack of windows and the temperature, which is fr either freezing cold or just scorching hot, so. Okay, teacher, um, what environmental factors do you see as limiting within your school? Katie Rudisell again from the middle school. Um, they said windows. I taught in a classroom for the past seven years without a window and had some of those kids in the class. And now I get a window. I think the first thing my eighth graders said when they walked in, you have a window this year. Um, some of our students go through the whole day with never seeing outside. And that's kind of sad. I know I did that for years too. I didn't see outside. I didn't know what the temperature was. I didn't know what was going on. Um, the other thing is the lighting, the fluorescent lighting. I can only imagine what's going to happen to our students' eyes when they get older, staring, first of all, at a Chromebook since we're one-to-one, -one, and then with that fluorescent lighting, I know sometimes I'll just turn the lights off for a little while because all of us just need to kind of take that break, um, and the kids just kind of go, oh, that's nice. So that's another thing, just that lighting that um, can really affect their learning. To piggyback off what most people said, our building has some heating and air conditioning issues. Um, our building is also scorching hot or freezing cold. Um, our students often just, we have like empty full of cubbies and we put their little sweaters in there and then when it gets cold, we just, we work in sweaters and we work in gloves. Um, interestingly enough, the, the one thing I have noticed, we adopted a great new science program and we have a lot of inquiry stuff that goes along with that science program, including growing things, you know, life cycles and stuff. Nothing grows in our building. We don't know why. No plants will grow. No bean plants will grow. Nothing will grow. It's either they always either get too hot and die, or they they don't ever get warm enough to actually germinate. 
Um, we also, the same thing with our like our butterflies will never go into their chrysalis. It's never gonna happen. And I feel so bad for my second graders every year. It never will happen, guys. So on the weekend, I come in and shamefully take those bad boys out, and I, you know, I have to put them away because um, they're not gonna be butterflies. <laughs> um, they, have, they can't go into their chrysalis. Uh, so, and the other interesting thing is, is that so sometimes we get so hot in our building, um, and again, I love our building, so I, I, I feel guilty even saying this, but our, sometimes it gets so hot that everything falls off of our walls and our lamination comes off of our posters. Like, not, like we'll come in after a Thanksgiving weekend and everything will be off and on the floor and all of our, all the lamination peels off of every poster we have in our room. And like, you know, you're like, how hot must have gotten in that room at that time, you know, for that to have happened. Um, and every room is different. It, it, my room could be 85 degrees, and then another room could be really, really cold, and everybody's in sweaters and stuff. And you know, I, you know, I hate to be like, oh, our room is so cold, it's so hot. But I mean, it, it really is. We get a lot of kids that fall asleep when it's really hot or complain of constant headaches. And then um, you get little kids that are just they're freezing, and you know, you can't do that.
problem-solving skills. That's what's going to lead them to be successful in the future. Okay, so when we take a look at what our own tigers say about this, the one that overwhelmingly, I don't care when we're talking with first graders all the way up to students who are seniors, they talk about, they might use different words, but they talk about being able to work with their peers, um, being able to work together. Um, they talk about common spaces, even though their words are a little bit different depending on the grade level. And if you look over here on the right, one of our high school students says, I would like to change the size and space around the school. A lot of classes are becoming crowded and teachers can't put as much effort into working with us individually. There is no room. All right, so we're going to now hear a little bit from our principal. We're going to start with LECC. So we have our youngest tigers ready to start school. They're super excited and we want to build off of that energy. We want to keep that momentum. We like to say we want our kiddos to run into the building faster in the morning than what they run out in the afternoon. And that sounds really simple, but the environment goes a long way to making that happen. We have a collaborative, innovative culture and we want our environment to reflect that. We want our students to be excited. We want when you all go out into Cincinnati, puff your chest out wearing that orange and lovely gear and you're excited because you are part of Tiger Nation. And Tiger Nation starts with our youngest learners and we need to make sure that our building supports that so that way our kids continue to grow as learners and love to learn and love being Tigers. So at LES, I'm very fortunate I have just amazing teachers who understand the importance of collaboration, innovation, creation, all of those things that they know they want to do. And in order to do that, sometimes what happens is it spills out into the hallways. And that's what you're seeing in there. So we understand the importance of having those kind of spaces. We just don't have them. So our hallways become extensions of our classrooms. We know our teachers like to work together. We know our students like to work together. So we, with my brilliant teachers, they make that happen. It's just, you're gonna step over kids as you're walking through the hallways. Hi guys, a lot of these things that you're hearing are not necessarily issues for the intermediate building. Uh, for example, what Mrs. Ford just talked about, we have those spaces here at the intermediate. We have spaces where we have little rooms that connect uh, adjacent classrooms. We have movable walls, so you can open up classrooms that are adjacent to each other and have one larger space. Um, the only really downfall with those movable walls are that sound travels through them very easily. So our issue isn't our space, it isn't having uh, intervention specialist space or special needs space that's close to our core space. It is right there. We, you know, here at the intermediate, you know, I'm basically the luckiest one to be able to talk up here because the building is the newest, um, and you can tell. And um, so, really, for me, you know, some of our our needs are things that you know we talked about earlier about loud spaces being next to other loud spaces. All of our specials offerings are all down here next to each other. Um, it's not next to core space, so those things are really nice. If I'm gonna say something that is like, boy, I wish I had, if we had newer movable walls that when uh, core instruction's going on inside those spaces when the wall is closed, it would be nice that we're not hearing what's going on next door. So this is, hello. Hello. So this is actually the hallway to our dungeon where we put the bad students. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have bad students, first of all. But it is a hallway within a hallway to one of our science rooms. So again, go. I think the batteries might be dying. I used to be a coach. We're good. So if we look at the space and when we talk about inspirational and relevant, this is this is the footprint, right, of a number of our classrooms and, and what it looks like and when we talk about that inspirational environment for learning. <coughs> being a coach in the <laughs> Anyway, uh, this room, I think a number of the students talked about, this is a room uh, for Spanish. This is a teacher who's traveling to Peru, who's going to the Galapagos, who has all these wonderful creative ideas. She
she wants to bring into that classroom with 32 students under the stairwell that's either boiling or freezing. So just that. Um, the other room you're seeing is obviously a book storage room. It's one of the few storage spaces that we actually have that we had to turn into a learning space. Um, and again, the teacher, as all these teachers said, does a great job in order to meet the needs of her students. The, the biggest issue is we do not have storage space. Storage space now exists in classrooms that take away the space that can be used for projects, music, learning, whatever it may be. And again, certainly in that Spanish class, there's not going to be the creativity that that teacher would like with 32 kids in that room. Um, and she is um, preparing all of these set lessons by traveling the world over that somehow she just can't get in there unless it's, I'm gonna show you a slideshow and she's just really not that interested in showing a slideshow. So, okay. Um, I think we're just gonna take a couple because we're getting kind of close on time. I wanna get you to the gallery walk. So if we could have like maybe one, uh, one or two students who wanna talk about what spaces inspire your learning and creativity and why, that'd be real helpful. Um, well, I would like to focus on one specific classroom uh, would be Miss Jackson's classroom. Uh, I forget what she did last year, but her students won, I would guess you could say, a room makeover. <laughs> so <laughs> they got, she got new furniture, which is really nice. You can stand up whenever you want. There's movie tables, I guess, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> um, you can just sit wherever you want. It's really inviting. It's it's somewhere I look to go every day. So two years ago is when I started in, I need to talk to you by the way. Um, I started in Mrs. Forth's class and she had a small class in the sixth grade hallway and I was in fifth grade so I always had to go down the stairs. But she just had a small class with a couple of comfortable chairs but then the next year, we got to choose so many privileges of seating and tables. And so last year, we were in the computer room. So it was this large room with so many comfortable seats. And we just had a lot of fun while working. Um, well, um, basically, being comfortable in the room and having a nice lighting helps me personally be creative, warming colors on the walls, just an inviting place helps me and I think I can speak for a lot of people, it inspires creativity and just being more into what you're being taught and like happiness in the classroom. to our teachers. Describe an environment that inspires learning and creativity in you and your students. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Birkin and I am a music teacher here in Loveland. I teach fifth through twelfth grade and so <clears throat> I'm obviously inspired by music but as you all know our auditoriums are not inspirational. Either of them, can I say that? Anyway, um, as, as Paxton Paxton said, lighting, colors, but also we need spaces that are that are open. We don't have spaces in Loveland where the entire student body at either any schools can really gather. We don't have community space that invites our community in. We, we want to be a part of the community. We are such a supportive community here and so many wonderful teachers and students and opportunities, and we our spaces don't allow that. We we need we need to prepare ourselves and our students for 2028. That's where we're headed, right? And um, and big spaces that allow us to problem solve, collaborate, be flexible and adaptable together. So I'm going to piggyback on a lot of what's been said, but um, at LECC, um, talking about that square footage, I mean, in a dream world, I would love double the size of a classroom for kindergarten. Um, but it, it's very limited when you walk into my room and you see um, 
there's a lot of care and craft that um, we, especially at the early childhood level, put into that lighting and that warmness for you as much as we can do the best with what we have. But three-fourths of my room is taken up by industrial made chairs that look just like what we're sitting in that you cannot um, expand, you know, collapse or adjust the height without getting a screw up to it. Um, same with our tables, and that's very limiting in a full day setting. I see it even and feel it even more then with our littlest tiger cubs who are five and six. Um, it could be as simple as having furniture in, in our room that you can literally tap with your finger and push all the way down. So we're sitting on the ground for things, or you level up and everyone's standing for the next one, just like all these kids here mentioned. Um, it's super important at our level too. Um, so furniture is really huge. At the high school, all of, in most of the classrooms anyway, it's just a desk, a chair, and a table attached to it. And um, it's really hard for the kids to get into groups of different sizes throughout the, just our cell. They'll want to go into groups of twos and threes and fours, and it's really hard to transfer into those in a quick manner. Um, you also have the desk is so small that you know, with the kids with their computer, they have their computers out and then the paper underneath the computer and they're lifting up their computer to write something down and it's just, they, they need more space and they need to be able to have um, furniture that kind of moves them in much more more quickly. We've seen that, it's definitely out there. We'd love to have some of it in our, in our schools. hard to find them, but the reality is is we could have tripled, quadrupled. Uh, our students are amazing. Um, I, am, uh, I am in awe of listening to them tonight and hearing their words, um, our teachers, and the way they presented this. Um, and I will give you a minute to appreciate them in just a second, but what I want to tell you is that Tonight the opportunity was for them to tell you the reality of what they're working with. Our students don't walk around and complain about their environment. Our teachers don't walk around and say, this is horrible. They all do the best with what they have. They love being here, they, they, they do what they can. These are their words saying, we could do so much more if we had. So I don't want you to think for a second that that this group of people walks around miserable because they're not. We asked them to tell you a very, a very just reality of here's our educational facilities. Here's what it's like to live and spend the day with what we do. But I hope you heard them say we, we do the best we can with what we have and what we want is more um, because they deserve that. So I don't want you to leave here thinking, gosh, what a bunch of whiners because they were eloquently speaking that this is, just, this is just how we roll, and this is how we get it done. And even with those situations, the amazing things that our kids and our teachers do are um, way too many to list. So I know that I, I, mean, I couldn't tweet fast enough or write enough quotes down from our teachers and our students, um, so I just greatly appreciate you giving us the time tonight and sharing your honesty and your principles coming in and saying, just, you know, how can we help school be better for you? Because that's what we want and that's what you deserve. So can we just appreciate them? <laughs> when I say, like, I go home and I'm like, I have the best job ever. Like, I really do. I get to hang out with these people all the time. So I do have the best job ever. So going back to the very beginning, how can we improve our physical environment, advance the mission for student learning and growth, while still being fiscally responsible. That's our charge. That's what we have to figure out what we do and how we do that next. So our job is to, is to present some options for you in January and start to prioritize what we've heard, what we can dream, what we can afford, and what we can do for our kids and our community. We'll start that on January 23rd. 